Peyton Place is a groundbreaking TV series that started in 1964 and quickly became a part of television history. It was one of the first to tackle subjects that were once considered taboo for the small screen. The show was set in a small town and followed the lives of its residents, revealing that beneath the surface of a quiet town lay a web of secrets. I remember watching Peyton Place for the first time years after it aired and being drawn to the character portrayals by the talented cast. Among them, Ryan O'Neill stood out as a young and promising actor, playing the role of Rodney Harrington with a charm that captured the audience's attention. Now I'm curious about your connection to Peyton Place. What's your most memorable moment or personal story related to this classic series? Your experiences add to the rich tapestry of its legacy, and we'd love to hear your stories in the comments below. Keep watching because there are many more surprising, funny, and touching facts to share about Peyton Place. So what's your story? The television series Peyton Place diverges significantly from its cinematic counterpart and the original book. The adaptation saw the Cross family written out and characters like Rodney Harrington were reimagined without a brother, while Norman Harrington was introduced as his sibling. Constance McKenzie, rather than owning a bookstore, ran a dress shop and was not depicted with a husband. Dr. Michael Rossi's profession shifted from a high school principal to a medical doctor. The essence of the series was retained through some character names, but the narrative took its own path. Notably, Dorothy Malone and Mia Farrow were pivotal to the show's success. Their departures marked a noticeable decline in its appeal. The character of Martin Payton, particularly in episodes featuring George Macready, stood out with his dynamic presence. Ruth Warwick, who played alongside Macready, brought a unique energy to their shared scenes, often trying to elicit laughter from her co-star with her antics. Despite mixed opinions on Macready's performance, his portrayal alongside other actors like Ed Nelson, Tom O'Connor, Frank Ferguson, Dan Duryea, and Ruth Warwick added a distinguished touch to the series. While other storylines had their merits, those involving Martin Payton remained a highlight for many viewers. Rodney Harrington and Allison McKenzie, although central figures, did not resonate as strongly with some audiences compared to the compelling drama surrounding Martin Payton. In the landscape of television dramas, it was the performances of Frank Ferguson, George Macready, and Tim O'Connor that stood out, as highlighted by their co-star Ed Nelson. Meanwhile, Christopher Connolly expressed concerns about his continuity on the show in 1965, despite ultimately staying for its entire duration. Joyce Gilson, who joined the cast as Jill Smith, was selected a year before her character's introduction, showcasing the show's planning and foresight in character development. In the early stages of development, a pilot was filmed in 1962 featuring a plot about the Cross family, which was ultimately removed from the final product. Later, in a dramatic turn of events, the network insisted on introducing a murder into the storyline in November 1964. The idea was to have Elliot Carson meet his demise, but this was overruled by executive decision. The following year brought an unexpected twist when a lead actress took a sudden leave, prompting the writers to improvise a coma scenario. The uncertainty surrounding the character's fate was palpable, with the production team keeping options open regarding her recovery. In the mid-1960s, a television drama became a cultural touchstone, reflecting the changing social landscape of America. At the heart of its success was Lee Taylor Young, the sole actress in the ensemble to be distinguished with a solo credit. This period marked the height of the show's success, with viewership and critical praise reaching their peak between 1964 and 1966. However, by 1968, the series experienced a significant decline, and despite efforts to rejuvenate it through the introduction of new characters and the casting of established character actors, the show could not regain its former glory. Concurrently, Barbara Parkins rose to fame, her popularity sparking discussions for a dedicated spin-off titled The Girl from Peyton Place. Despite the initial enthusiasm, the project was ultimately abandoned. The series' trajectory mirrors the ebb and flow of television trends and the ever-evolving tastes of its audience. Working alongside Mia Farrow, Ed Nelson shared his observation that her unique presence on set signaled a promising future or a tragic end. Nelson himself, along with Barbara Parkins, held a consistent presence throughout the show's duration, from its inception to the final episode credited in each one. 
As the second season commenced, the production expanded significantly at 20th Century Fox, utilizing extensive studio resources, including five sound stages and multiple outdoor sets, with the studio's public square even serving as the fictional town's hospital exterior. When Joyce Jilson joined the cast, there was anticipation she would follow in the footsteps of her famous predecessors. Despite the expectations set by the press, her rise to stardom did not materialize. Around the same time, Barbara Parkins expressed a desire to exit, feeling her role had reached its potential and become routine. Contrary to her statements, she stayed with the series until it ended. Additionally, Ryan O'Neill brought to light that to maintain quiet on the set. Sedatives were used on infants during filming. These revelations offer a glimpse into the off-screen dynamics that shaped the production. Behind the scenes, the show's drama was as compelling as its on-screen plots. Co-stars Christopher Connolly and Patricia Morrow's off-screen romance was revealed to be a studio-orchestrated event to garner publicity. John Newland, known for his work on the anthology series One Step Beyond, directed a significant number of episodes in 1965. He later reprised his role as host and director for the successor series The Next Step Beyond in 1978. Dorothy Malone, who felt her character was being eclipsed by Mia Farrow's, left the show in 1968 and subsequently settled a legal dispute with the studio. These off-camera events added layers to the show's history, reflecting the era's studio practices and the changing landscape of television production. In a significant shift, the departure of Mia Farrow led to the introduction of Rachel Wells, a new character designed to fill the void left by Allison McKenzie. Barbara Rush's decision to join the cast was influenced by the convenience of the filming schedule and proximity to her family, allowing her to maintain a balance between work and personal life. The series saw another change when Lee Taylor Young exited due to her pregnancy, marking a period of transition for the show. In the summer of 1968, Barbara Rush, a prominent actress of the time, turned down two film offers during the show's break. Lee Taylor Young was cast in a role that was originally named Alicia, but this was later changed. Warner Anderson, who played Matthew Swain, continued to contribute to the series as its narrator even after his on-screen appearances ended with the first season. Notably, he did not receive on-screen credit for his narration work. These behind-the-scenes decisions and changes reflect the dynamic nature of television production and the unseen contributions of actors beyond their on-camera roles. Dorothy Malone, who portrayed Constance McKenzie, enjoyed a relaxed schedule by late 1965, working only two days a week and describing her job as the easiest she ever had. Casey Rogers, recognized for her role as the troubled mother of Barbara Parkins' character, seamlessly transitioned to the role of Louise Tate in another series without needing an audition, largely due to her performance in this show. After the sitcom ended in 1972, Rogers largely stepped away from acting. In the same year, Malone faced a life-threatening health crisis, including a pulmonary embolism and pneumonia, which led to her temporary replacement by Lola Albright. Once recovered, Malone rejoined the cast, continuing her role as the steadfast matriarch. In the world of television dramas, casting decisions can lead to unexpected turns. Ruth Warwick secured her role through a personal connection with the casting director. Meanwhile, Jill Rowland's initial casting was nullified due to network demands, altering the storyline significantly. Mia Farrow, despite her doubts about the show's potential, found herself bound by a contract she sought to escape. It took the influence of Frank Sinatra to free her, resulting in her character's abrupt departure from the narrative. Later, the writers subtly referenced Farrow's real-life circumstances by introducing a plot twist involving her character, coinciding with the release of her film Rosemary's Baby. At the height of its popularity, the show's Christopher Connolly was inundated with fan mail, receiving around 400 letters weekly. In a notable event, Barbara Parkins, alongside her co-star Ryan O'Neill, presented the Miss Teen International pageant in 1966. Meanwhile, Ruth Warwick candidly shared her unfavorable opinion of working with O'Neill, describing him as excessively self-admiring to a fault. In a twist of fate, James Douglas's portrayal of an attorney in the unsuccessful pilot Hawk's Landing caught the eye of Paul Monash, leading to his casting as Stephen Cord. The series broke new ground in 1968 by introducing African-American characters, a bold move at the time, with Ruby Dee, Percy Rodriguez, and Glenn Turman joining the cast. 
However, this progressive step was marred by controversy when writer Gene Boland voiced his dissatisfaction with the handling of their storylines, resulting in his dismissal. Ozzie Davis, Dee's husband, was brought on board as a consultant in an effort to navigate these choppy waters. Meanwhile, Susan Oliver, known for her striking appearance and portrayal of complex characters, left a lasting impression with her role as Anne Howard, whose dramatic exit from the series left viewers in shock, and her performance as Vina in the cage continues to be celebrated by fans. In the world of television dramas, the cast often forms close bonds due to the intense work schedules. Dorothy Malone and Tim O'Connor, who worked together on a popular show, passed away within a short span of each other in 2018, marking the end of an era. Their co-star, Joyce Gilson, despite the demanding schedule of 13-hour workdays, expressed her fondness for being part of the series. The behind-the-scenes dynamics were as dramatic as the on-screen storylines, with Ruth Warwick revealing that Ryan O'Neill's romantic involvement with Barbara Parkins ended abruptly due to infidelity. These events reflect the personal and professional highs and lows experienced by the cast during and beyond their time on the show. Dan Duryea made the decision to pass on a role in the musical Finian's Rainbow for a part in a popular show. Diana Highland, when approached for the role of Susan Winter, accepted without hesitation, despite it meaning she had to let go of a movie role she had been offered. Following Dorothy Malone's exit in 1968, there was speculation that Lana Turner might join the cast, reprising her role from the 1957 film. However, Barbara Rush was ultimately chosen for the part. In a twist of fate mirroring the drama of the show itself, Susan Oliver, known for her role as Anne Howard, narrowly escaped death in an aircraft accident shortly after her character's demise on screen. Meanwhile, Joyce Gilson, who portrayed Jill Smith, continued her journey in the series universe with a role in the subsequent daytime drama. The character Betty Anderson, brought to life by Barbara Parkins, was initially slated for an early exit from the series. However, the character's growing popularity among viewers led to a change of heart from the producers, allowing her story to continue. For five years, viewers were treated to a unique experience as each episode presented fresh content without reruns, even during the summer months, which was a departure from the norm for primetime television. On set, Jenna Rollins was known for her strict no-cigar policy, citing adverse reactions to the smoke. Meanwhile, Barbara Parkins shared an amusing encounter with Bette Davis, who quipped about Parkins' character's relationship with Rodney Harrington, highlighting the show's reach and the strong impressions it left on its audience. Transitioning from black and white to color, the show marked a significant shift in its visual presentation in 1966. Behind the scenes, despite her role as a creative consultant, Erna Phillips did not receive credit in the show's official lineup. The narrative took a turn when Casey Rogers expressed concerns about her character's diminishing involvement, leading to discussions about Henry Beckman's potential return. However, these talks stalled due to financial disagreements. Dorothy Malone took on the role of Constance McKenzie, becoming a familiar face to audiences through her performance. Barbara Parkins, known for her portrayal of Betty Harrington, returned to the character in a reunion movie over two decades later. The show's distinctive opening credits and preview scenes were voiced by Dick Tufeld, while Warner Anderson provided narration for each episode as Matthew Swain. In the summer of 1966, Lee Taylor Young went for an audition for a role in a well-known series. She chose to perform from the Glass Menagerie, showcasing her acting skills. Around the same time, Lana Wood caught the attention of Paul Monash with her performance in The Long Hot Summer, leading to an offer for the role of Sandy Weber. Coincidentally, Wood had intended to reach out to Monash for the same part. Despite Ed Nelson and Barbara Parkins being listed as part of all 514 episodes, they did not actually appear in each one. Their contributions were significant, but not constant throughout the series' run. In a candid revelation, Ed Nelson expressed the cast's initial skepticism about the show's potential, a sentiment that was far from isolated. This skepticism was echoed in popular culture, with Mad Magazine creating a parody titled Passion Place. The show also served as a reunion for Aaron O'Brien Moore and Lee Phillips, who reprised their creative synergy from the original film, transitioning from on-screen roles to behind-the-scenes influence, with Phillips directing several episodes in the final season. In the landscape of television dramas, 
The experiences of actors behind the scenes can be as varied as the roles they portray. Barbara Rush found her time on set to be highly rewarding, describing her opportunity to infuse her character with personal touches as a unique aspect of her involvement. She also appreciated the adaptable schedule that the production offered. David Canary, another member of the cast, faced an interesting proposition from producer Paul Monash, who advised him to consider a name change. Canary chose to keep his given name, a decision that certainly did not hinder his career. Christopher Connolly's entry into the cast came about serendipitously. While assisting a fellow actor during a screen test, he caught the attention of Monash. Although the initial purpose was to support his colleague, it was Connolly who left an impression, resulting in his casting as Norman. This unexpected turn of events highlights the unpredictable nature of the acting industry, where opportunities can arise in the most unforeseen circumstances.